Yeah. Uh, so my task is to chase back the time, right? So that's why uh, I put the last slide uh, up front, so before I forget them. So I acknowledge all these uh, speaker, all these uh, contributor to my study from a different hospital in Hong Kong, so I can make this possible, uh, this uh, presentation possible. So I think um, I don't have to elaborate too much on the background because uh, uh, the previous talk already talked about astrocytoma is one of the commonest brain tumor in children, and then the, uh, for the low grade, usually they have a good prognosis, especially in the uh, overall survival. Uh, uh, data and then so we try to review our data uh, and <clears throat> I think uh, one of the thing is um, people I think most of the uh, uh, experts here uh, uh, treat uh, childhood leukemia uh, but I would just uh, let you know the CNS tumor based on the Hong Kong data as you can see uh, ALL account for 22 percent of our cases and CNS tumor account for 21 percent so they are very much close in number uh, of uh, occurrence. So the, uh, if you look at the brain tumor of both adults and children, astrocytoma actually uh, but if, uh, only account for 6.8%, but if you add the uh, uh, GBM uh, uh, and some other uh, glioma, uh, that the percentage will go to maybe around uh, 20 uh, to 30 percent. So um, the, uh, a lot of meningioma uh, and uh, metastatic tumor in adult, so you can actually, you cannot see the pediatric uh, uh, profile in this particular data. Uh, but in Hong Kong, uh, we compare our data uh, with uh, the oversee the SEER data as a uh, mentioned previously by the other speaker, actually our germ cell tumor, in fact, in our experience, is second most common tumor. Uh, uh, the percentage is 21% as compared to astrocytoma, also 21%. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, but percentage has no meaning, uh, so the most important thing is to calculate the incidence. So the astrocytoma incidence in the Hong Kong Chinese population actually is only maybe around uh, a little more than half of that of the overseas uh, Caucasians data. But if you see, look at the germ cell tumor, our incident is alarming high, it's 6.3, not 2 point something as pointed out in the previous speaker of the Japanese. So we are even higher than the Japanese based on our population-based data. So um, our study is a retrospective review of a population-based uh, uh, cohort from 1999 to 2014, 16 years data. So um, in Hong Kong, all these patients underwent treatment in five local hospitals, a public hospital because in private, there's no uh, pediatric oncologies. So basically, we capture almost all children. But later on, I will let you know that we actually missed out some of them. So then the, the we capture all this data prospectively by two full-time data managers. And then uh, we uh, actually uh, verify this data with the Hong Kong Cancer Registry in an annual basis. And our data, uh, usually we review them in an every month uh, tumor census uh, meeting. So there are around 158 children within that 16 years period has high or low grade astrocytoma. And then the, uh, if you um, uh, uh, I mean, eliminate the brain stem tumor and spinal tumor because they are different animals, then uh, around 107 of them uh, are located in the cerebral and cerebellar. As you can see, the grade one and grade two astrocytoma are almost more than half of the astrocytoma uh, that we usually encounter. And then here, uh, we, I uh, purposely, uh, I mean, put the other type of scryoma uh, in this category because usually the treatments are, are, are quite different. And for the seeker, actually this is one of the uh, uh, type tumor I think is underestimated because a lot of time patients with tuberous sclerosis, um, they uh, were taken care of by the neuro uh, neurologists. A lot of time the boundary between SEN, what we call subependymal nodules, and subependymal giant cell astrocytoma is very hazy. So a lot of time they consider that SEN, uh, but actually if I review them, 
I say that they are seeker. So the most important thing is uh, who read the film, okay? Uh, and that uh, because I have around 20 something patients with uh, tuberous sclerosis, actually I capture three more of them. But most of them did not have biopsy. So if you look at the location of this uh, grade one, grade two tumor, here I would like to emphasize, as pointed out previously, grade one, grade two esocytoma are totally different from grade three, grade four. So they vary, actually progress to grade three, grade four. Uh, they have different biology. So in terms of location, the grade one, especially pilocytic esocytoma, the most common location in our cohort is the cerebellar, so inferior fossa, and followed by the phalamic, hypophalamic area, and then the optic tract, uh, uh, I mean, uh, grade one tumor is uh, around six, this, uh, uh, um, and then the other one in different part of the brain is uh, eight of them. And whereas in grade two, low grade, diffuse low grade uh, glioma is a different story. In, in fact, the temporal loop is the most common location, and this is the group patient usually presented with temporal loop seizure, and the seizure type can be very interesting. Sometimes they embase the parents 100 times a day, and that is the, the seizure. So um, this is the group of children that you have to pay attention to, but because of the location, most of these patients, they cannot have complete total uh, recession because the tumor usually go up to the hippocampus area. So um, if you look at uh, uh, grade two, uh, the diffuse knee infiltrated low grade glioma is the most uh, uh, common one. And then the, for the grade one, the parasitic esocytoma is the most common one. So excluding the, the spinal esocytoma in other types of uh, glioma, we identify 65 patients with cerebral and cerebellar low grade uh, esocytoma. The median age is around 7.95 almost eight years old, but uh, the range can be quite wide, uh, almost even male to female ratio. And cerebellum is the most common location because the parasitic esocytoma is the most common one and followed by the supercellular region. So the surgery was the most common form of treatment uh, in 57 uh, patients and then the 18 more of them receive additional chemotherapy. Here I'd like to mention, actually the molecular diagnosis now come into the picture. We started to do this around two years ago, so I don't have data to share with you, but more or less uh, our experience is quite similar uh, to the West. Uh, and then this molecular diagnosis not only help us probably in the future identifying uh, uh, actionable target, but they also help us to confirm our diagnosis. Because, for example, the BRAF uh, V600E uh, basically account for, seven, it was found in 70% of the pyomorphic sample uh, uh, cytoma, but uh, uh, whereas the KIAA BRAF fusion is found in 90% of, uh, uh, I mean, in, uh, uh, are in the uh, parasitic esocytoma patient. That means that usually if you find this uh, fusion, uh, they are most likely parasitic esocytoma. But it doesn't, not, uh, doesn't mean that the parasitic esocytoma has such a high fusion, okay? So this is a distribution. I think I will not go into the detail uh, because you can uh, uh, look, look it up in uh, Amar Gajar's uh, uh, review paper. So the, the Sika story, uh, um, the Everolimus uh, has been, uh, uh, this is the first paper uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine, and actually uh, this Everolimus can, be, uh, can actually suppress uh, the Sika uh, tumor. And then, to, but once you try to stop it, it tends to regrow. And then there was a question whether uh, you will stop it if that is the case of tuberous sclerosis. Uh, I personally think that you shouldn't stop it because tuberous sclerosis is a germline genetic mutation. Probably you have to treat it for life. But there, one of our patients with Sika actually does not have tuberous sclerosis gene mutation. And then for that group patient, if in case it cannot be surgically resect, probably you can try the evolulimus and then if it disappears, probably you can stop it and see. So I will not go into detail. So um, for our patient, uh, basically surgery alone is the uh, uh, main state of treatment, especially for inferior fossa uh, uh, parasitic exocytoma. And then we have a different uh, chemotherapy regimen. 
So the most commonly used is the carboplatin and linquistin, two weekly. The carboplatin is 175 milligram per meter square, linquistin is 1.5 milligram per meter square. So basically, uh, this is the most common uh, 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 protocols we use if the patient need it. But lately, I mean, there are some studies showing that just your carboplatin alone may have the similar eff efficacy. But carboplatin has a problem. In the Western uh, 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 population, around 38 to 40 percent of them will develop sensitivity to carboplatin with this protocol. So they have a problem. So they may have to uh, challenge them, and then maybe around half or even less than half of them uh, will then develop tolerance. But in uh, our local population, we are a little bit more fortunate uh, because uh, only two to three uh, uh, patients out of this cohort actually develop carboplatin uh, hypersensitivity. Uh, in our uh, population, some of them, the parents insist to use temosolomides because it's an oral drug. Uh, and, uh, and in my experience, just like uh, mentioned before, once you have to use the chemotherapy, I usually tell them in five or six years or seven, eight years, the tumor will regrow and then we may have to try the chemotherapy again. And the experience told us that you can actually can use the same chemotherapy protocol. But for thermosolomide, one thing you have to bear in mind, uh, actually the emesis is a, a major side effect uh, for this group of patients. In Boston Weekly, we also use this, and actually it's a very interesting drug. And then some of the patients in the first three months of treatment uh, may have, uh, I mean, paradoxical increase in size. So you need more than three months uh, of observation for this group of patient. But of course, if the patient has uh, uh, impairment of function, that become a problem. So personally, I don't think the PCV and all this uh, is now, uh, uh, I mean, uh, being advocated anymore. So the patient usually receive uh, more than one courses of chemotherapy if they need it. So um, we don't advocate RT for our patient with a low-grade uh, glaucoma anymore because the biology is different. And now we believe if the patient can actually uh, uh, have this uh, low-grade tumor, uh, the telomerase uh, uh, is not active. So the telomere keeps shortening uh, within each cycle. So if they reach a certain age, the tumor will stop growing. So that's that's why, I mean, no matter what treatment we give, actually the survival is excellent. So it's almost a 90, 100%. The patient who die, you have to pay attention to, are the infants with the chiasmatic uh, astrocytoma, parasitic. These are the group patients. Usually the tumor can be quite aggressive. So if you have to treat, you have to treat early. So, and uh, five years overall survival is 93%, and then the total survival is 100%. So this is my conclusion. Uh, childhood low-grade astrocytoma has relatively good prognosis, even if unresectable. So don't worry. Uh, the, the thing you have to worry is the function. So no intensive chemotherapy could suppress the pro progression of a significant proportion of these low-grade tumors and achieve long-term survival. And then even if it recur, uh, we could utilize chemotherapy again and avoid using RT on this group patient. With new molecular targets available, the role of target therapy should be explored. But of course, the BRAF6 story uh, is scary. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>